Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us. My name is Matthew Pacer. Um, I am a reference librarian here at the Library of Michigan, and I help coordinate the Michigan collection um, and the Rare Book Room. And I also am the donation coordinator. And along with that, I give presentations like this, uh, sit on the reference desk, answer emails, uh, and other duties as assigned. So again, thank you for coming. Uh, just a little brief agenda here for us. I'm um, going to talk a little bit of an overview about our collections uh, for those of you who are a little bit unfamiliar about who we are and where we are, where we are, and then provide a little bit of history and some historic context to some of the conflicts, uh, wars that Michigan was a part of um, throughout its history. And then we're going to move on into, um, for me, to highlight some of those resources that I think could be very beneficial for someone doing research in that area or wanting to, to just learn more information about Michigan's involvement um, and the various conflicts. Again, welcome to Michigan Military Resources. Well, not here, but at the Library of Michigan. So who are we? You know, what is the Library of Michigan? You know, we are that state, um, that institution in the state of Michigan created to help preserve, to collect, and provide the access to our story, that story of the state, and to help support libraries um, as their, as in their role as an essential community anchor. Now, we've been around for quite a long time, as many of you um, have heard from us before, um, and our dis different presentations. We've been around since 1828 during, during the territorial times and as a territorial library. And, you know, that early territorial library, you know, we had about 130, 135 items. So we are one of the longest continually functioning state agencies out there. 1837, we officially became the Michigan State Library with statehood. So yay for statehood. Then we packed up all of our bags in 1847, and then we moved over here to Lansing, you know, without the assistance of 96, 94, you know, nicely paved roads and so forth. So that, that movement had been quite interesting to pack up all of our 130, 135 items and ship them over to this side of the state. Then we moved around about a bunch of different buildings, you know, from 1847, as Adam mentioned previously, we, we did have a stop in the uh, current capital. We've occupied buildings on Michigan Avenue in downtown Lansing. We had a branch up in Escanaba and probably a few other storefronts. But 1983, under Public Act 540, we become the Library of Michigan, our name, which is current. And that kind of really helps um, to differentiate ourselves between the Michigan State University Library, which is, which is just down the road about five miles. And from time to time, there can be some confusion on researchers calling us or calling them say, and asking for resources. And, oh, you actually mean to call the other place. Then in 1988, um, the Michigan Library and Historical Center opens, MLHC, which is that image on the right-hand side of your screens, the building that we currently reside in. So for those of you who have not visited the library in a long time or who have never visited the library, we always do encourage you to stop by. You know, we're open Monday through Friday, 10 until 5, and Saturdays, 10 until 4, you know, except for the holidays. But also within this building and that picture on the right-hand side is the State Museum and the State Archives. So it really is a good one-stop shop for Michigan history and something to visit if you get a chance. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, I really like this picture um, because I think it's a really good image of the inside of our building. And the Library of Michigan you know, occupies our public service, our print collection, that second, third, and fourth floor, which you can see in that image. The image with the tables kind of front and center, that's the atrium, it's the second floor, which um, houses the Michigan collection, state documents, um, our audiovisual reference desk, um, Michigan newspapers. The third floor holds the 
state law library and the current periodicals um, and our general part of our general collection. And then on the fourth floor, that top area that is cut off, um, there's the rare book room, the federal documents collection, which kind of focuses on the Great Lakes area, Old Northwest, and the uh, non-Michigan periodicals, things like Time, Life, other magazines, journals, Harper's Weekly. You get the idea. But this image itself was taken um, in the end of 2019 for the fall family uh, history lock-in that uh, hopefully will be occurring later this year uh, in November. But I know in, I think it's July, is the Barbara J. Brown uh, Family History Seminar. It's uh, June. June. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So hopefully there will be a lock in there. Um, so I hope to see as many of you in the library side during that lock in event. So let me go ahead and talk a little bit more about some of the collections that I just mentioned. Michigan documents, you know, we're required by law to really to collect those items produced by state departments, commissions, or agencies, annual reports, joint documents, compiled laws. Um, the Pioneer Collection or the Michigan History Magazine. So there's a lot of things that can be related to um, family history research. Michigan Collection, whole gamut, periodicals, gazetteers, plat maps, county histories, cemetery transcriptions. It really is a collection of both commercial and privately published and unpublished materials when we can get our hands on them. I, so this is my donation coordinator um, sales pitch to you all. You know, as you're going through and maybe you're weeding out your own library collection or your basement, um, whole, you know, garage, uh, attic, and so forth, you know, if you have books about Michigan or books by Michigan authors or booklets, Maybe even poster. Maybe you have a poster of the Michigan Agricultural College, some event. You know, give give us a call. I would like to talk to you because these are things that we might be interested in adding because we always are trying to grow our collection. Um, we also have, as I said before, that state law collection um, on the third floor. Again, focuses on Michigan and that Great Lakes area. And then we have the rare book room, which kind of encompasses all the collections and we will put items in there for different reasons. Currently, um, it's a kind of a one third breakdown, one third Michigan, one third law and one third general Americana. And we place things in there for different reasons. There could be a monetary value, but most of the items are maybe they're fragile or they're just so few in existence that we'll bring things into the rare book room that's um, open by appointment. And that image on the uh, kind of the bottom right of that group of four, uh, that's the reading room. Um, so that's kind of what, what the reading room looks and we will bring out materials for you to look at. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So I want to talk just a little bit of real quick, some history at this point um, before I move on. Um, because I want to talk about the history because I want to help give you some context so when you do begin your research or continue your, your research that it helps hopefully identify some leads or other research interests because bottom line there's just a ton of material in our collections that could be helpful for you so let's start with that colonial period some information here well it really is the the oldest military organizations um and what we know as the United States early as 1636. And you're looking at a big age range here, as I say on the slide, you know, 16 to about 60 years old. The image on your, on the right of that screen um, is a, or should be a bounty land warrant from the Revolutionary War. And so when we're thinking about doing research and about Michigan history in this period, we need to think about that the militias are based on towns and counties. Excuse me, and some of the earliest come from 1636 from a general court order by the Massachusetts Bay um, County for what we know as the Pequot War, you know, the fur trade, the Pequot uh, versus the, the colonists and the allies of the colonists who were subjugated. 
Um, but probably the most well known is going to be the Seven Years War or what many people are more familiar with, the French and Indian War, which occurred between 1756 through 1763. And this truly really was, you know, that first world war, as we can sort of define it currently, where, you know, Britain and Portugal and Prussia and Hanover and other states, uh, Germanic states, aligned against the French, the Spanish, Russia, the Holy Roman Empire, and Sweden. And looking at that 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 conflict, some of the starting points. Um, for example, we have Austria that wanted a part of Silesia that it lost to Prussia back in the 1740s. Uh, there were parts of Pomerania that went to Prussia because of an old house called the House of Griffin, um, it died out and there were no heirs. So it passed through marriage lines over to, to Prussia. England um, supported its relatives in the German states. Um, and then we also have um, mixed in with all this, we have uh, the Spanish empire in decline. But from our uh, vantage point here, the conflict kind of started over here in the colonies with England attacking uh, disputed French areas in the West, you know, areas that we know of as, you know, Tennessee and Illinois and, and Kentucky. And it ended in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris, as hopefully many of us know, where what we see here is England received New France, Spanish Florida, and some Caribbean locales. And the uh, native populations were left out of the treaty and the results. And this led to Pontiac's War in 1763, because they were left out of the settle settlement. And what is uh, important to take away from this historical par uh, part is that England was unlike the French. Uh, the, the French, I wouldn't really call them colonists, um, the fur traders um, tended to treat the Native Americans as, I wanna say as, as, as equals, but more as, as partners, whereas the English viewed um, the native or indigenous populations as conquered peoples. And then they brought settlers in and there were no gifts or no trades um, with the conquered peoples. So that was always kind of lurking in, in the back after Pontiac's war. So that, that kind of pushes us into the American Revolution, 75 through 1783. And from Michigan's standpoint, um, Detroit in this Western theater was a staging area for the English. So as my slide here talks about, you know, the Continental Army and the Navy were created for this conflict and then disbanded at the end with the peace treaty in 1783. But from us, so all those militia units that were drawn up, produced, um, were there to augment that Continental Army. So going back to this Western theater, which is what Michigan occupied, or what we know as Michigan occupied, um, the English troops were under the command of Henry Hamilton, and then uh, George Clark was the senior commander for the militia units, and the they were the Kent uh, Kentucky militia units in this West Theater, and um, some residents of this area probably did participate in this Kentucky militia. So there are numerous fights uh, and uh, skirmishes during the Revolutionary War. Hamilton was actually captured, but Detroit was not. And it took some time uh, for England to leave Detroit because that's the area that they did win um, at the end of the uh, French, and in, uh, French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War. 
and move the fur trade somewhere else after the Revolutionary War. So then immediately right after um, this period, you know, we have to think about as we want to do research that we are now in this Michigan territory, you know, the 1805 in the Michigan territory, because we then move into that federal period where from a military history viewpoint, there is just a small standing army and Navy, and those militias are just there to supplement those standing armies, um, that standing army, that standing Navy. The states are there to furnish the men and all the equipment. So this early period, you know, these militias, you know, are providing most of the troops that, that we see who fought in the Mexican War, in the Spanish-American, and in the early months of the Civil War that we might want to do um, research in. But also during this uh, federal period in the 1800s, you know, into the, the latter part of the 1800s, even, we are starting to see the creation of a couple different services that are out there. The cutter service, the lighthouse service, the steamboat inspection agency, and the life-saving service. You know, these groups that kind of become merge so forth into what we know as the Coast Guard. So another branch is slowly being formed during this federal period throughout the 1800s. Now, from a research standpoint, um, it can be difficult to find records. Um, there's a lot of things that have been destroyed. A good example are those pension and bounty land warrant records. Um, if you use that collection, I think um, I think it might be on Family Search. I know it's on Heritage Quest. Should still be on Heritage Quest. I think it might be on Family Search as well. But these the, the pension and bounty land warrants. You know there are sections in there where you, if you're looking through those records for names, you might come across. Um, I think they're they're like slips of paper um, that will give you an indication because you're searching for a name like John Smith or some name and there's a slip of paper at that record point and what that is telling you as a researcher something was here it's now lost it's I, I think there was a large fire that took a chunk of those records and burned them up so there's a lot of things that are no longer um, surviving so that you know tells us that we need to start thinking about different resources as we want to research about Michigan's participation in the conflicts and in the wars. Think about maybe those other state documents like the pioneer and historical collections, things that might provide some maybe first or secondhand accounts, maybe some family history accounts of those early settlers and early, excuse me, early residents of Michigan. You know, also thinking about what other institutions or organizations might have ties or connections to Michigan, like France or Canada. So um, like in the pioneer collections, one or two of the early volumes, I wanna say it's like volume seven and volume eight talk about the, I think it's the archives in Ottawa that have a lot of information that somewhat pertains to the area that we now call Michigan. So think about those other places, you know, maybe newspapers um, and so forth. I'm gonna move to the next slide. Because during the same uh, federal period, militarily, uh, we have a couple different things going on, not just those like cutter service and other services. We do have the War Department starting up, 1789, then the Army. Um, or 84, that's that's a long, a long discussion. There's a lot of books that you can read that could probably talk much more in depth than I can. Um, the Navy, the Marine Corps in seven, uh, 1798, and then splitting off, uh, made part of the Navy in 30, 1834, and then its own branch in 1953. So all of these, all these things in military history are being formed or combined or split apart as the nation grows. So when we're thinking about doing any kind of research in Michigan 
and its involvement in conflicts and war, this timeline, I think, will help the researcher kind of see if I'm looking for a family member, and this is, you know, roughly they're born between these years. Well, maybe look at, well, they're born in 1816 to 1830. Well, they would be roughly in the age for the serving in the Mexican War, 1846 to 48. Again, this is just kind of like a potential clue as you're researching your family history, because maybe these are resources. Maybe a family member was born between 1831 and 1847. Maybe it's possible they served in the Civil War. Well, maybe that um, should be an, uh, a research lead. Well, I never maybe looked at the Brown books that I'll mention and talk about later on or other resources. I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide in just a few more seconds in case someone might be jotting a few pieces of information down. Um, while you're yeah. waiting, Matt, I did oh. put a link to the Pension and Bounty Land Thank you. Born Applications on Family Search. Oh, so they are in Family Search. Okay, good. Yes, yeah. yeah um, and just they, a reminder, they moved around. Yeah. Um, and just a reminder that Family Search is a free resource to use you just have to make a um account a free account to use it um but that's something that anybody can uh utilize um when you want to look at that record of that set of records and the plethora of other stuff that they have thank you so much and thanks for looking and getting that 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 link there so i want to move on to that next slide because in in our collection you know particularly in the michigan collection there's all different types of of records that you can find you you might stumble upon you know muster rolls maybe unit histories or just like secondary histories of campaigns or maybe battles or parts of books you know maybe something um like county history that might briefly talk about different aspects of that county's participation and those two images there are the two things i grabbed as examples, it says, you know, history of the Michigan Soldiers Aid Society, 61 to 1865. Um, and then below it, you know, it says uh, this another ex example from there, you know, history of the Michigan Soldiers Aid Society. Just to, just to give you an idea that you can come across different types of records in our collections. And not just what I said here, but here are a few other things casualty lists, maybe some veteran census, such as the 1890 Union Veterans and Widows. Maybe there's some reunions. Maybe there was, you know, a regimental reunion or, or this type of reunion that was compiled, published, or maybe even privately published that we have um, been able to get. So I, I want to definitely plug, search our catalog send us an email or give us a call to provide you some some guidance and i also just um uh i would want to also plug you know to also think about your local level your local library your local historical society your local genealogical society what kind of avenues of information or assistance um can they provide to help you find materials or even um to get you more and and um, to, to have a much better research experience, so that when you are planning a, a trip to us to maybe uh, to do some research on that military component of your family history, that you know you have a much better game plan. So you can really hit the ground running and to be able to ask us questions. So you can make a better um, better use of your time, and that's kind of why I have this slide here. Is you know where. Where do I start when I want to do this type of, of research? You know, things like, you know, you know, question, you know, what what is your question? You know, what are your are your wanting to search? And also, you know, taking stock of that information you already have, maybe that folklore that's been passed down through the generations, maybe some of the printed material, the other research leads that you have generated. You know, talk to family, close friends. Um, that local genie society, local historical society. Maybe there are Facebook groups that are already working on these topics that you can tap into to make your research trip to the library of Michigan much more fruitful. 
you know, one uh, example that I like to give, and some of you may have heard me say this uh, many times over, um, from time to time, there is a uh, members of the Chamberlain family group prior to COVID would meet in the Michigan Library and uh, History Center building here to hold just basically a general informal meeting as those members of the family kind of trade stories and research leads. You know, maybe there are groups like that that might be maybe active on Facebook or um, elsewhere that can help you move along. And then lastly, answercat.org. Answer and that's the link to our catalog. That definitely, definitely make it your friend so that as you're generating those research, research leads, the, the family names, um, maybe names of places, battles, whatever, that you can use those and search in our catalog to see what comes up in the results list. So that you can, you know, when you stop by, you can look at them. And if you're a Michigan resident, get a library card with us. And if we've got a second copy or a third copy, check them out and take them back home to, to read and peruse. But you just have to bring them back to us in the building. Um, we don't really have a, a mail return service. So it's the, the one little caveat that's there. So I want to talk now about um, some specialized, well, I wouldn't say specialized, but some sources in our print collections that you're going to find that can be helpful for your uh, military history research here at the Library of Michigan um, to help generate new leads, maybe even help you um, generate new questions and maybe uh, close some dead research ends and provide closure for you. So um, definitely, you know, there's that the history of the Wolverine State by Dunbar and, and George May. It definitely, you know, that seminal work about our history provides a lot of context to what's going on in the different conflicts. And again, that's bibliography, it's research leads. But if we're focusing um, on military sources, have to point everyone to Michigan's Early Military Forces by Leroy Barnett and Roger, uh, Roger Rosentrader. That's its call number here in the collection. Um, if you want to write it down. And what's special about this book is it's that answer for Leroy and for Roger and their view, the answer to the Brown books for the Civil War. And that is, it's basically a rust, you know, a brief history of the conflict with a bibliography of sources, but then also a roster of the soldiers, you know, for the revolution, 1812, the Black Hawk War in 32, the Toledo War. Well, I get, I mean, we'll still call it the Toledo War. Um, uh, the Patriot War, Mexican-American War. Um, so, and as I said, it, it's a brief history, but what they point out is, you know, roughly 25% of the adult male population served during this time in these different conflicts. And it's a great place to start your research. But then there are other biographies and place histories, campaign histories, and so forth that provide some general information. Hey, Matt, there's a yes. question that came sure. up in the chat that I think um, is a good one to um, to touch on. Yeah. And uh, they were asking, uh, because they were perusing the website a little bit earlier, looking to find some records, and they had seen that there was a note uh, that there was a fire sometime in the 1950s. Do you know what was lost? Okay. Um, so do you want to give a quick recap yes. of what happened with that fire? Yes, yeah, and, 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 and really, that's a good tie-in um to this topic a little couple slides down but it's still a good tie-in well actually it's not even any of the slides but um yes if you are interested i would definitely recommend going to google and searching you know state of michigan library fire you know 1951 and you're going to see images of a fire that we had when um library occupied the, that top floor that penthouse floor of the what's now called the Elliot Larson building here in downtown Lans Lansing. It was called the Cass building. That's its previous name. And if you look at the current building, you can see that the top floor is gone. I forget, that's like five stories, six stories, and whatever it's, it's down to now. But yeah, we don't know 
how much we lost. You know, that's the best estimate, 30 to 35,000 items. So there's many things that we lost. And what's interesting is there was a, and you'll find stories if you, if you Google um, newspaper stories, there was a man who did not want to go to the Korean War. And he was a state employee and started a fire in a trash can. But it expanded beyond the trash can and just engulfed that top floor or two floors. And you can see in those pictures the huge icicles because they called in all sorts of fire units from the surrounding cities. I think Jackson might have been some of the fur one of the furthest ones that were sent up here to help. Jackson, so it, Grand Rapids, Rapids. Oh, Grand, Flint. even further. Flint. Yeah. So it was yeah. it was huge. And I def I mean look at those images because you'll also see the help that the community uh one of our local high schools eastern you know opened up their field house and you'll see pictures of books on the bleachers and you know library staff and others having to painstakingly go flip pages to help dry the images or not the image dry the books out that could be saved so there was just a lot of damage and some of the books we have in our collection still will have a little um plate in the in the front of the book that will say i survived the fire so I, I don't know how many that we have but many of them who did you will see that in the front so when you're here and it's a book that's you know you know from the early 1950s or before look at that front and see if it has a plate um but you know, unfortunately when, there isn't any sort of a master list no of what was lost i think no. in the, you'd agree that the, like in the chaos of everything that was going on afterwards because it took my mm. understanding is it took close to about seven days for the fire that i don't know yeah stop smoldering enough yeah. that they could really do start moving things over to the field house mm. so um yeah i see there is another uh Question. Yeah, another question uh do you have records on the war of 1838 or would those be in windsor Okay, I'm. Uh, is there? A, I is that? Are you referring to the Patriot War? Because that's the only time, only war that I know associated with the year 1838. And I honestly, I I don't know without actually consulting that book by Leroy Barnett. Um, they said yes. That's... Okay, so I, I would say checking there and that book to see the sources because Leroy and Roger really hunted down a lot of leads of where to go for material for that war but they also have a, a list of those michigan residents who served or the early settlers who served in that patriot war so i mean if you want you can um send us an, an email and to librarian at michigan.gov i'm going to type that in like uh the, Actually, one thing that's cool yeah. is that particular book, oh. uh, Michigan's Early Military Forces. Mm -hmm. Is that the one that you were talking about? Yes, correct. That's on Read Michigan. Oh, so better. that is available. I'll put the direct link to it. There you go. Uh, Thank you, so, Adam. Yeah, because that I believe that was a notable book. It may have in, been back in early time, three or oh four, and it's a mm -hmm. Wayne State Press one. So okay. that is one that uh people can um read immediately you. online yes you can go oh yeah michigan resident you can go right to it well congratulations you're <laughs> you're welcome doreen I'm, I'm glad we made your evening it's probably the best part of the this whole presentation but going back here to the american revolution that i want to you know find my place again um we, we've got that old northwest and the american revolution by skaggs and then those documents of the american uh revolution and i put their uh, colonial office series because you may want to use that in you know searching our catalog you know but maybe if you go to the library of congress catalog you can search colonial office series because that's kind of what it folds under um, but it's a general source and it focuses specifically particularly the skaggs book on the western theater and how it contributed to the war you know this general area that we reside in you know the warfare its diplomacy the problems that occurred for the soldiers um and has an excellent bibliography. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Oh, sort of. Hold on here. There we go. War of 1812. Um, 
a couple of different things I want to talk about here. That first one, that document transcriptions. See, there's a spelling error. War of 1812, um, Northwest by Richard Knopf. Um, I want to emphasize this particular multi-volume set because each book has a different title. And this is as close as you're going to get to an everyday account of the War of 1812. Reports being generated at, in the field, daily life, what the conditions were, what the fighting was like, you know, maybe even copies of some letters. So that's a really useful first-hand account source when researching. Very good primary. Um, then we've got the Soldiers of 1812. It's compiled from many different sources. You know, could be county histories, family histories. Um, and you may find um, things like, oh, if, there, if the death is known, you know, maybe the cemetery, maybe spousal information, um, perhaps what the soldier did during their service. Then we've got that pictorial field book of the War of 1812 by Lossing. And it's really, you got to think about this as a travel log. That's what this is. Um, it occurred, the publication of this occurred around the Civil War, and it really marks the, that a good first scholarly work on the War of 1812. A lot of illustrations, a lot of history, maps. Um, so it's like kind of like a reading vacation. And what I think would be extremely useful from the researcher, you know, as you're maybe you've identified family members who participated in the War of 1812. If you're able to to find, oh, they served here, they were here, to look through that pictorial field book that talks about that area of the United States, because since it was written um, during the Civil War area uh, era it's going to provide as close as we can a, a description, a snapshot of what that family member, what that person saw out there in the wilderness, as opposed to what we can see in, in, in Google Maps or in various other resources that, that we have that really doesn't give us a good picture of what, what they experienced. So I'm going to move, go ahead and move to the next slide. So we've got to talk about the Civil War. There's a lot here. Um, definitely the brown books. That's an image on the right-hand side. Um, and I just want to let you know, let everyone know. I mean, there's a lot of written about the Civil War. You know, search the catalog. You know, there's the there's Bruce Canton, Michigan author. Um, all kinds of Civil War books, but you know, the brown books are a really good resource that if you know my ancestor you know served was a michigan resident go to the brown books we have a set in the index tables um near the reference desk they're alphabetical and as you can read on that that image to the right you're going to find different pieces of information i'm just you know i'm going to pick a name william osborne the third one down you know enlisted in what company in which infantry a year um how many years and age you know, mustered um, in, were they wounded? Maybe they died. Um, maybe you'll be able to get a a uh, where they mustered, where they mustered out, where their pre, uh, present residence. And and I always uh, tell people, you know, to look at those brown books because of the the um, potential resource, uh, not research leads. So, you know, maybe you're, you're doing some family research and you're stuck because John Smith, just that side of the line just kind of fades away and disappears. Well, maybe, you know, John Smith or William Osborne in this um, case served in the Civil War. I'm going to the Brown Bugs. I'm looking. OK, mustered out at Nashville, Tennessee, present residence, New Hudson, Michigan. We mustered out. Well, if we if you've lost the research lead on that family, and maybe he mustered out in Tennessee, uh, wherever it said Nashville, maybe that gives you a clue. Maybe I need to start looking at Nashville or whatever city that is. Maybe he decided to move back there, start a family, start a brand new life. You know, we don't know, but that provides another research avenue for you. 
going to go ahead and go to the next page because some other titles, you know, the list of pensioners on the roll, January 1st, 1883. And this is part of a bigger set. But the ones that we have cover Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin, you know, the cause of the pension um, should be able to get their monthly rate and um, the date that it was originally allowed. Um, that second resource, it's what it says, Michigan at Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and Missionary Ridge. It's that campaign history, along with many other ones. Um, a recent, was it a donation? No, it's actually in our collection. Um, there is a journal called Veterans. It's in our rare book room. Um, and it's, we would understand it as a newsletter. And it's fascinating to read. You know, they're, they're, they're talking about reunions of different regiments, units, um, the comings and goings, what's happening, you know, um, what's going on. Um, with any of the, you know, Grand Army of the Republic reunions that are out there. So, you know, looking through our catalog, you might be able to find different interesting resources, whether they're periodicals or other books that are kind of general in nature. But there are other things. Here are two examples, you know, the Iron Brigade by Alan Nolan and General Henry Baxter. And the Iron, Iron Brigade, you know, it talks about the formation of the unit, its command structure, its politics. Um, and then Henry Baxter, it's a more of a battle and campaign book um, about the 7th Michigan Volunteer Infantry. So these are the things that you might be able to um, stumble on. Um, to answer the question by Christine there, you know, do we have any resources with Civil War soldier photos? Um, no, I would direct you first and foremost to the Archives of Michigan to see if they have any, any photos. I would also point to um, the, not just your local library, but finding out the GAR hall that the family member may have joined if they did. Um, that's a much better question if you email us, if you know like a particular uh, location, um, we might be able to help try to point you to trying to find if there is still a, a hall or that local library or, or historical society that might be able to maybe point you into a, a different research direction to see if any photographs are still around, because that's a really difficult question um, to answer just based on the time passage, because many things have not survived. Um, but that takes me into, you know, talking about those encampment volumes, you know, those GAR. Thank you, Adam for throwing those those links out there. Um, no problem. <laughs> see, this is why we we tag team out here. Um, so we have numerous encampment volumes and they will list, you know, elected officers. Um, they will talk about, you know, reports on the soldier homes, on the activities, what's going on in medicine and law, what's being done to advocate for the veterans, you know. Um, and maybe the the GAR hall, if one is in existence and if it is a museum, they may have information. Um, maybe even if we're lucky, even, even images. So if we move on to the Spanish-American War, um, United Spanish Amer uh, War Veterans Proceedings of the Annual Encampment, same concept, it's the annual encampment, you know, proceedings, just like I just mentioned. Um, you know, it's reports, projects, advocacy, um, tracking laws. Um, that second one, Michigan Volunteers of 98, it's a photographic record of Michigan's part in the Spanish-American War. Um, it, unfortunately, we don't have anything like this for the Civil War um, um, because, you know, it has an index and an, it gives you the name and the regiments and the company and the rank and residence of those volunteers for 98. 
Um, that would have been a wonderful resource if those things were created for the Civil War, but they were not. Um, there's also another great book called um, Letters from Michigan Soldiers in the Spanish-American War. And again, as, it, as it, I just said, it's, it's that daily life, it's letters, um, you know, how soldiers were, were, were treated and so forth. So that's a great book. Again, Letters from Michigan Soldiers in the Spanish-American War. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. World War I. There's not that many out there, but they're the honor roll books from the different counties. There's just a few counties that, that have them. Kalamazoo, that's the example I put there. And if you search our catalog, just type in honor roll and, you know, Kalamazoo County or honor roll this county or that county to see if, if one pops up. There's not that many, maybe 10 or so or fewer, um, but they're gold mine for that county itself um, and information, maybe list death information, regimental life, maybe you get some bur uh, burial information, um, were they mustered out, um, Red Cross information, the War uh, Mothers of America, uh, maybe a little bit of a history and chronology of the division um, that the soldiers were a part of in, um, from that county. So it's, it's enormous, it's wonderful. Another resource there, the War Work, work for Women. Women. It's a newsletter and press releases from this organization, you know, talking about the home front, the war effort, you know, what was going on here, are, you know, food drives, were there conferences, were there, um, you know, workshops, seminars, things to help, you know, the family back at home with this, you know, long conflict. You know, another great example is there's a book called, um, I think it, I think the title is the 32nd Division in World War I. It gives casualty reports, descriptions of, of actions, um, awards given, and so forth. Again, it's specifically for the 32nd um, Division. But if we move on, you know, we're going to get a similar type of information in World War II. Things like, you know, the 475th Military Police Escort Guard Company by Gene. Um, and that name should may be a little bit familiar sounding because this book will be useful to read because it really, it's not the foundation per se, but it's a contributing uh, group, unit to what we now know as the Michigan State Police. Um, or what's the Michigan State Defense Force and kind of becomes the, the Michigan State Troopers as, as we know them today, you know, the organized and, or, and unorganized. Um, that next book, Johnny Capo, the, you know, it's a P-38 pilot. It's kind of a biography. Um, so there are other items like that that are within the collection. And as always, we're always looking to to you as, as patrons, as researchers, you know, that donation pitch. If you find something, give us a call. We're always we're always looking to add um, information. But there are still others, you know, adventures in the martial education and informal history of the military academy by Dwayne Miller. Maybe you didn't know, we actually did have a military academy kind of like West Point of the Midwest. You know, it has sketches of officers, you know, who, who graduated and served there, the curriculum. Um, Michigan State's Defense Forces, the, the history and the lineage of the emergency volunteers and its predecessors. Um, So by saying, you know, talking about a little bit of the other, other works, um, I hope to give you some ideas that, you know, the Michigan military history, you know, it doesn't just revolve around conflicts. You know, there is that home front. There is the, that, you know, the, the, the police units, the, the home front work, or, you know, the education, this military academy and so forth. So when I go to this next slide, you know, where to start, 
that's where I want to end up for our presentation is here, an image of our catalog, um, because I want to make sure that everyone who wants to learn more about Michigan's involvement and how Michigan contributed to make this your friend. This is an image of our catalog and you got basic and advanced search options, you know, those different you know, names of soldiers, events, battles, campaigns. Um, use the basic search, use the advanced search, see what comes up to generate research leads. Send us an email. Um, we will try our best to, to provide you guidance, some research leads and so forth. So with that in mind, um, the last slide I wanna put up here before I turn on my camera and open up the questions for us. Oh, it's questions, well, the next slide, sorry our contact information, our phone number and our email and address on the right hand side, along with our website, the link to our um, how to get a library card. It's, it's for the digital library card. So if you're a Michigan resident, you can apply for a digital library card and you can access some of our digital resources online and viewing some of those, or excuse me, how to view some of those resources through the family history link. So with that, I'm going to start my video and open up two questions if anyone has any. I think we caught most of them so far in the chat, okay. Matt. So I, I thought so. Yeah, I would just say that if anybody does want to unmute themselves to ask questions or if they do cool. want to add add more into the chat, now is definitely a good good time. Uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, while uh, while we're waiting for anybody to do that, um, I did just do a quick search on Read Michigan to see what would happen if I put in just the search terms like Civil War. Mm -hmm. And there are probably about a dozen or so books mm -hmm. that come up on there that are probably good starting points okay. for titles if somebody is doing research into mm -hmm. um, either just general Michigan in the Civil War. And yeah. so like, uh, you know, these men have seen hard service. The, mer the first Michigan sharpshooters yep. is, a is one of those really good ones. Or like yes, uh, Bob B. Sacker's I Hope to Do My Country Service, which is the Civil War letters of uh, John uh, Bennett, uh, MD surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, and a few other ones uh, that are just like Grand Rapids in the Civil War. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, those, those like, focused ones. Yeah. Yes. So um, sometimes, uh, especially if you're people in Michigan who maybe can't necessarily get to us right away, you can at least kind of start out with yeah. looking at a few of those as you're starting to kind of put together your your research plan. Yeah. yeah it's always good to have that that good game plan so you, that when you do decide to visit us, that you can really hit the ground running, and you know hit those resources and generate more leads or maybe, you know, answer questions um, and so forth. We're always, you know, definite big, big advocates to make sure that you're getting a good use of the time that, that you do have when you visit us, because it, for some of you, it may, it may take an hour or two to get here if you decide to drive. Can... Any questions? Any questions? And that's fine if you don't, because... Oh, we got... So wait. Um... This is Marge. Hey. Um, I just have a question, more of a uh, thoughts or opinion than mm -hmm. probably resources, which I'm not going to be able to get to, mm -hmm. is I have a person who was in the Spanish-American War, and he lived in Detroit, but he had joined um, the military, or the port, that portion of it, mm -hmm. um, in Ohio. Um, okay. I'm guessing it was Toledo. And yeah. I'm just kind of wondering why not in Detroit as opposed to Toledo? Not as that, excuse me, not that it's that far away, but it seems to me you would just sign up in you know your hometown as opposed to traveling yeah. to another state. Yeah, I, I unfortunately I don't know how to to answer that because that that question. I mean, I've. Um, fielded that question numerous times before, and I have not seen a good reason. I mean, yes, there is. It, it could be a short distance. Um, I don't know. In your family history research, was there any connection to the Toledo area? You know, no. that's a, okay. So that's one idea. Something else. 
um, to think about is who, not, not who, no, wrong. What <laughs> unit is being mustered out of Detroit versus what area is being mustered out? Um, not mustered out, mustered in, sorry, in the Toledo. So like, you know, is there this unit and this regiment, this unit and this regiment being mustered in where, you know, maybe this family person says, oh, this unit mustering in in Detroit is going into the thick of the, the fighting, but maybe this unit here in Toledo, maybe they're going over here. You know, maybe they are more of a support unit or they are some type of like um, going to a different theater in the Civil War. So, you know, what, what unit is going where? You know, maybe that unit in mustering in and Toledo is being trained somewhere else. You know, it's it's those those issues that may may have influenced that man to travel that distance to go to Toledo instead of Detroit. Well, I suppose that's probably reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know yeah. if going to, you know, a different front would have had anything to do. I did find some. Yeah some documents for, mm. uh, I, I can't remember. I don't have anything to mm. reference to be exact, uh, where he, it seems like he was in, in the hospital mm. a good part of the war, at, you know, so he probably had contracted malaria yeah. or, or something. And yeah. I'm not real sure he actually fought, although okay. he does have military service. Okay. Something else to do if, if you haven't already for, you know, a question similar to that is, okay, you, you know, he mustered in in Toledo, you know, have you gone to the Toledo, Toledo Lucas County Public Library's local history room or, you know, contacted them or, you know, I, I don't know what organizations cover best Ohio's participation in the Civil War, but maybe there is context information of, oh yeah, we saw a lot of people from Michigan come down to Toledo and this is what we as Ohioans saw as a reason why that might shine some light for why he okay. may you know venture down there instead of Detroit. Well, one, one other thing to kind of point out too is that I was just kind of doing a little bit of a quick search on just like muster activities during mm. the Spanish American war. And from what I'm understanding is that when Michigan first started contributing soldiers for the Spanish American war, it was national guard units that mm. were first called up. Um, but where it's, so it says here, and this is from on the DMV page, Michigan's governor ordered out the National Guard and attempted to turn the units over intact as volunteers to the federal government. This, however, was not in compliance with federal law. And as a result, each individual was required to volunteer as an individual rather than as part of a unit. Mm -hmm. And so it said practically every member of the National Guard volunteered. Um, and that, that's when they were organizing and I think uh, getting together at um, Long Lake mm -hmm. over um, west of Detroit. But it could have been that maybe the muster activities in Ohio were different at that time that Ohio was maybe taking volunteers, anybody as a volunteer immediately, whereas Michigan was saying, like, mm -hmm. we're going to use our National Guard guys before we start calling making a second call for anybody but then having to start training them as opposed to national guard soldiers who already had some level of training oh, okay so you're thinking it's more of a, a head count issue yeah it could have been more just like a logistics of where michigan was like hey we've already got guys organized in some way let's send them and your ancestor could have been like, but I still want to join. And then yeah. that's why they went down to Toledo as opposed to trying to join up in Michigan. Yeah. Okay. I, oh. you know, sounds reasonable. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't, I, I don't want to say that that's it's, what happened, no, no, but no, I just, understand totally. yeah, it's, it, it, when I'm reading this, this mm -hmm. um, thing that's on the, the Michigan uh, mm -hmm. military and veterans affairs page, page. Mm -hmm. on Michigan military history, that little bit makes me think, yeah, yeah maybe Ohio might have been doing mm -hmm. it a little bit different and may yeah. and 
gave a quicker opportunity for somebody who wanted to remember the main and yeah. go serve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like well I'll I said, put the link in the chat ball. too. Yeah. Good. Thank you. It's a good guy. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, Thank it gets you. into the, mm -hmm. you know, during all these conflicts, what were the muster activities? Yeah. And how were soldiers or mm -hmm. potential soldiers congregated in areas? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, up in the formation of the different units and what those units were going to do. Yeah, because like the three divisions for World War One from Michigan, mm -hmm. 32nd Division yeah. was um, National Guard soldiers yeah. from Wisconsin and Michigan. Mm -hmm. The 85th was all people that were, I think, drafted and then mm -hmm. from elsewhere and they mm -hmm. were at Camp Custer. And then the 14th Division that never went overseas went, geez, but was in training was at Camp Custer at the time the war ended. So mm. different ways in which they joined up at different times throughout the mm -hmm. the the conflict. Well I think that's probably true for other wars that mm -hmm. you know have transpired over the years. Yeah. That you know people either signed up for various reasons and just, you know, they didn't really do anything. Yeah. That was always just something that sitting around in the back of my head, you know, you get all those things you'll never find an answer to. Yeah. Well, never yeah. say never. Let's hope. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> well, no, I've got a, quite a few that there's that they're never. <laughs> yeah. Quite a few. Thank yeah. you, fellas. Yep. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions before we, we uh, wrap up uh, tonight's program? Well, if they if not, that's okay. Yep, then they can always send us an email, library yep. of Michigan or librarian at michigan.gov or give us a call at 517 335 1477. Any last parting words, Matt? Come see come see your state library. There's yes. a lot to see, a lot to research. All right. Uh, I think that we will call it a night and yep. just remember that our next one is going to be on uh, June 1, Thursday, June 1 mm -hmm. at 6.30. And that'll be a little slightly different than what we've done uh, for the last several. But we hope to see you then. And mm -hmm. until then, everybody have a good night. Yep.